welcome back. We are now moving on, um, closing our executive session and moving on to the next segment in our agenda, which is item number four. Before we get into that, I do want to remind everyone that we do have rules of decorum. Persons present at council meetings are requested not to applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statement made or action taken at such meeting. Citizens shall direct their remarks exclusively to the council oh chair. Citizens will strive to be accurate in their statements and avoid making personal, rude, or provocative remarks. All statements should respect the dignity and seriousness of the proceedings. Citizens conduct, should conduct themselves in a manner expected of all meeting participants. It shall be at the discretion of the council chair to ask any person making inappropriate statements and or conducting themselves in a disrespectful manner to see such action or risk being asked to be seated or removed. Again, we are into general public comments. This is for non-action items. Please come to the podium and state your name and address, and you have three minutes. My name is Mike Doyle. I live in Falmouth on Shady Lane. I'm here to address the council about a letter that the Falmouth Town Council received from the Maine Civil Liberties Union five years ago this month. I'm going to quote from it because the town of Falmouth had the same type of uh, restrictive rules for public comment that this town has. And it said, unpleasant comments are an unavoidable part, perhaps an essential part, of the hurly-burly of living in a free and open democracy. Justice Brandeis wrote that the freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think uh, means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. That's Whitney v. California, 274 U.S., 357, 375, 1927, Brandeis J. concurring. This freedom inevitably results in speech that some find undesirable. However, because we are a country that values free speech so highly and because the courts are understandably cautious about granting government, which would be the town of Scarborough in this case, the power to regulate the speech, a content-based restriction must meet stringent requirements to be found constitutional. Because the rule changes that Falmouth propose do not meet these requirements, they should not be implemented. Consequently, we strongly urge the Town of Falmouth Town Council to reject the proposed amendments to the Falmouth Council rules as unconstitutional. In addition, we condemn the Council's passage of the resolution that attempts to limit protected speech. I don't believe anyone here, pay grade, rises to the point where you can amend the United States Constitution and specifically the Bill of Rights. So if you want to challenge me on this and take me to court, I'd be happy to do that. I'm here to find out when I'm going to get the uh, answer about how much Mark Franco has charged the town and the taxpayers here to resist answering a freedom of access question. Now, if my experience with Mr. Franco holds true from Thelma, he's probably billed someplace between five and $10,000 not to answer the question. And the reason I had to sue Scarborough was the initial bill was $3,500. It's now been reduced down to $570. This is for 1,200 emails between the chief of police and three women. I'd like to find out when I can get this bill to find out how much he's charged you folks not to answer the question. Thank you. All right. Does anybody else wish to speak? All right. Saying none, I will close general public comments. On to the next item, item number five, minutes of the May 6, 2015 regular meeting. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. And any discussion? And seeing none, all those in favor, and that is unanimous. Item number six, adjustments to the agenda. There are none at this time. Item number seven is treasurer's warrants. I will do so throughout the course of the meeting. And on to order number 15-036 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the renewal requests for a special amusement permit from Black Point Inn, located at 510 Black Point Road, Bailey's Campground, located at at 274 Pine Point Road, Higgins Beach Inn, located at 34 Ocean Ave, Libby Mitchell Post 76, located on 40 Manson Libby Road, Loyal Order of the Moose, located at 19 Spring Street, and the landing at Point Point, Pine Point, <laughs> 353 Pine Point Road. And again, this is a public hearing. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? And 
saying not, I will close the public hearing. And this is also an action, so close your veto. Move approval. Second. And any discussion? All right, and saying none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. On to old business. Order number 14 103 is second reading on the proposed First Amendment to Contract Zone 3, Main Life Care Retirement Community, Inc., located at 15 Piper Road. Um, does anybody wish to speak on this item? And seeing none, I will close the public comment. And um, before we take a motion, Tom, would you just bring us up to speed on this item, yes, please? Yes, uh, this is a matter that's been with Council since late last year, as I recall, starting in December uh, 2014. And I believe tonight will be the final uh, time that uh, this matter is before Council. It is to approve an amendment to the contract zone um, covering uh, the Piper Shores facility. Uh, fairly, uh, you, you might recall it started as a broader discussion, but it has been limited uh, to the addition of a total of, and I, I see them in the audience, so they'll correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a total of 28, 30, 30 additional assisted living units uh, as part of the existing building. Thank you, Tom. Pleasure of the Council. Move approval. Second. Second. And discussion. All right. And seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Great. Thank you. Next item, order number 15-026 is the big one, which is second reading on the proposed FY 2016 school and municipal budget. Does anybody wish to speak on this matter? Please state your name, address, and three minutes. My name is Leslie Skillen, and I live in Portland, Maine, 105 Caleb Street. But I'm here on behalf of Maine Behavioral Health Care and the Trauma Intervention Program. And I'm just speaking in regards to the municipal proposal of um, funding for community programs. And we provide 24-7 um, emotional support services to the first responder system here in Scarborough. Uh, we are a group of volunteers that are highly trained in emotional first aid. And we come to the assistance of citizens of Scarborough um, when a traumatic event has occurred in their lives. We are available 24-7, 365. Last year we received a little under $3,000 for that 24-7 service. Um, we were able to be here on scene within 20 minutes after a request for service. And in doing so, it allows the first responders of your community to go back into service um, to assist others that need help from the police, the fire, and the rescue. Um, we're also an extension of quality care that you provide your citizens in Scarborough. And both chiefs uh, of your fire department and of your police department are on the advisory committee um, and are very active in the role of making sure that the trauma intervention program is there um, to be part of the system of care for your citizens. <coughs> Last year we serviced 164 citizens and 71 first responders while on scene. So I just wanted to thank the support that the Town of Scarborough has given us over the last six years and would like to encourage you again to consider um, an appropriation for about $2,978 to be able to keep the program um, available to the citizens here. Thank you. Good evening. My, my name is Larry Hartwell. I live at 9 Puritan Drive. This year I finally decided to get, be an engaged citizen and try to educate myself on the process. I want to publicly thank both the town and school department finance committees, the finance directors, and the staff of both the town and the school department for their help and openness in helping me better understand the whole process this year. Uh, it's been a bunch appreciated. Um, so here I am. Um, we seem to have a divide in our community year in and year out over the school budget, defeated budgets that are minor cut by the council and finally passage. This dynamic appears strong and healthy again this year. I think the council has a major role in reducing the divide and polarization in our community. 
and that can start tonight. Your task with the spending in the town and ultimately our tax rate, you alone. I ask that you do not just simply pass along the proposed 8.2% increase, which is approximately $3 million over last year. I would ask that you vote for, instead for a 35 to 4% increase. It would go a long ways towards reducing the animosity in our community. Please take an active role and not just push this out to the voters. You can do this. Thank you for your time. And if you do wish to speak, still do feel free to line right up and try to go through as many as we can. Good evening. My name is Nancy Urban. I live at One Pine Ledge Drive. I would just like to um, thank the school board for the amount of time uh, and effort they've put in into creating a school budget that I think supports the Scarborough schools in a manner which we need to continue to do. Over the past six years, we've seen the school budget reduced and we've seen programs cut, and this <coughs> is a detriment to our students. And I know there are citizens in our town that, you know, meet, that have that strug struggle with paying their taxes. But there's also a contingent that I speak to on a regular basis that would actually say we could increase our taxes to support our schools better. I'm not saying a huge increase, but there's a, a strong contingent of people that believe that much in our schools that I think is unfortunately not very vocal. But um, we all want appropriate spending. We all want um, appropriate measures to be taken in the budget process. But I feel like our, our students deserve better here in Scarborough. And I think I would recommend that you have the citizens vote on the budget that the school board has recommended. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on this item? All right. Seeing that, I will close the comments. And um, before we get into the motion, I do just want to offer, um, well, before we get into the motion and lots of amendments, <laughs> um, I do just want to offer, um, there was a question, what happens What if the budget is in effect and the school budget fails to be approved by the voters? Um, so I did have Tom reach out and ask legal opinion. I learned something new. The statute changed a little since last time I looked at it. Um, as far as the school budget goes, Article 20 of MSRA Section 1487 requires that if Scarborough school budget referendum fails and no school budget is approved by July 1st when the new fiscal year begins, the school budget that was most recently approved by the town council with cost center allocations provided by the Board of Education and was submitted to and not approved by the voters for referendum shall be the default budget. This year, the default budget would be the school budget to be approved by the council this evening or tonight. So if we were unable and unsuccessful, the last approved budget is this budget. And that was what would be moved forward for the fiscal year. Although I do want to, um, just reiterate through through some of this is that the budget would not stop there for the school department. We would continue to have meetings and we would continue to go to referendum until a time when one can pass. Uh, the reason why, and, and if I might add just my two cents to the legal opinion, because again, um, is, is that conversation did take place. Uh, my first year on the council, I was um, the liaison to the Charter Commission. Um, it, is something that came up during their conversations. Um, this provision, whether that is school or town, you know, depending on, you know, our charter takes care of what happens on the municipal side. Um, the financial obligations of the, of the council do not end July 1st if something's passed or not. We still need to maintain our payrolls. We still need to make our, our debt obligations. So it was a mechanism so that we didn't basically default financially. Um, but again, I do just want to reiterate that the referendum process doesn't stop, and it would be the budget tonight that moves forward if it were to fail. Um, so with that, and as promised, finished with that, we will entertain a first motion on the main motion. So um, if I can't point of order, I believe, I believe there needs to be a motion. Sorry, I am. Um, yep. 
fighting off bronchitis. For and there needs to be a, a, a motion and a second for the main motion in the night. And we can offer a So I would move approval. Second. Thank you. So um, now that we got a first and a second, I do just want to let everyone know um, we are going to start with Sean Babine, who was our finance chair this year, um, to lead us into the first part of Finance Committee's recommendations. Sure. Just as a brief overview um, that has been presented before, um, the process of the Finance Committee has been pretty lengthy this year. We actually started in late November, early December, um, that not only included the Finance Committee meeting, um, our Finance Committee meeting, but it also included a new step in which we actually joined with the School Board's Finance Committee um, in which we talked about our joint effort um, because it is one budget that we present to the town as a whole. Um, that has been um, extremely fruitful. Um, it produced, um, if anything, a baseline and a foundation for us to move forward that will hopefully outlive any of us as leaders. Uh, but more importantly, it also provided a nice pathway for us to understand more in depth about um, the services that we do provide at both levels. So I do want to extend, I believe, on, I'm fairly certain on behalf of the entire Finance Committee, um, a thank you to the School Board and particularly to the Finance Committee and to Chris Siazzo as its chair because it was a very, uh, um, very worthwhile effort and uh, very pleased with the outcome. Um, what I would like to do is actually, um, normally procedurally, you would have to divide the question to take up uh, to take up how this is being presented, but if it's okay with the chair, I'll simply cover each of the sections. I think for complexity, mm -hmm. it would be easier if we just simply deal with the municipal budget, um, and I'll focus in on the recommendations, and then um, if you would like, then focus in on the schools after the conversation of the uh, municipal side, if that is okay. We have motion one and motion two. Yep. So the first motion one is to move approval or to amend the budget and accept the Finance Committee's recommendation adjustments for the proposed 2016 municipal budget in the amount of $289,306 for the new net budget of $17,671,601. Um, that proposal, um, we have details, and I do hope that they actually, uh, one, if it is not pres uh, provided on the chair for citizens, it will be available online. But really the focus of that is between the two items that we take into consideration. The first is our operating budget and our day-to-day -day expenses, and the second is our capital expenditures, which deals with projects and capital improvements. Within the operating budget, the Finance Committee was presented with many proposals from the um, administration that really refined their budget projections. Um, unfortunately, with timing, with contract negotiations, um, health care expense um, or health care uh, estimates from the market, um, so forth, so on, as well as bonding issues, it's very difficult from day one to know what those exact numbers are. And that's very similar that you'll see on the, um, the town side. Um, at the highest level, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, we are projecting an additional increase of revenues of approximately $285,000. I'm rounding those numbers up, if you don't mind and then a decrease in expenditures of 455000 The primary sources of the expenditure increases is an increase in projected excise tax. Um, as you go through the year, you're able to obviously project out um, better revenue uh, streams um, that uh, the finance director can do. So we added 75000 from that source. We also increased um, revenues from our beach revenues account by 50000 and the most significant increase really came from our management team, which was $160,217. And that's really a bond premium um, or, um, a, in essence, a rebate of costs because of our good financial standing when we went out to bond this most recently. Um, the second piece within the capital budget, it's a $451,000 decrease in expenditures and an increase of $565,000 in revenue. Um, the primary, and I, did not, I, I apologize for not mentioning under the expenditure size, the most significant portion of that 455, which is on both the expenditure and the revenue, is the removal of the pay-as-you-throw um, um, issue or the pay-as-you-throw program that we have referred to the Energy Committee for consideration. Um, again, that's on both sides because it was um, something that was being considered. Um, and then lastly, the, um, there was an additional revenue, um, significant revenue of $500,000 from the Pleasant Hill Road um, construction, and that is a state reimbursement that was not included in the original because we did not know at that time what that amount was. So um, with that, I can answer uh, some additional questions, but maybe I could defer a few of those to our town manager, given my voice. 
Um, so that <coughs> was, in, I'm assuming, the form of a motion? Yes, please. Do we need a second? Second. All right. And any discussion on motion one from Abine? All right. Wow. All right, then. Going, going, gone. All right. All those in favor of the amendment? And that is unanimous. So if you flip that page right over, there is a secondary motion. So in the form of a motion, I would move approval of an amendment to accept the Finance Committee's recommended adjustments for the proposed 2016 education budget in the amount of $1,841,777 for a new net budget of $39,130,225. And that's in the form of a motion, so I need a second. All right. Now and I can explain it. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't do that before. <clears throat> um, so, again, the, the most significant portion of the adjustments were recommendations by the school board and particularly the superintendent staff um, because, again, as they started the budget process, there is a lot of unknowns and uncertainties with contracts and with other market conditions. Um, some of those adjustments that have been presented is that there is an increase in revenue of approximately $250,000. Um, most significantly of that is a $225,000 use of their um, fund balance. Um, and I'm going to net, the net total appropriations is a decrease in expenditures of approximately $1.5 million. The two most significant pieces, um, or I'll, I'll actually mention three. The first is a decrease in the school's um, regular budget of $1.1 million. Again, that's attributable primarily to understanding um, the impacts of the contracts, health care, and other pieces um, that fall into that um, kind of small pieces. Um, a happy word from Augusta, which is um, very rare nowadays, is actually a decrease in the charter school tuition that would be normally paid out of our budget and sent to the state to cover charter schools is actually now being fully funded by the state. Um, be careful, though, with what you are um, thinking because you don't know what they're going to do at the state level um, with the total pie of educational money, and they may decrease GPA that comes back to us, but I believe that they've committed to not doing that this year in particular, so I think we're fairly safe with that. The other most significant piece was really a, a, a transaction that was recommended by the Finance Committee and approved by them, not recommended by the administration, was an adjustment of $90,000.92. And that was really the a conversation about level services approach to their budget um, regarding any increase in uh, new investments, um, a similar approach that was taken on the municipal side. And then I did want to uh, mention that the capital um, budget is also being decreased. Um, I don't have that total here. I apologize. Um, the most um, significant portion is um, uh, the, high school, the high school one to one computing that is within the capital budget, understanding that that is being recommended to be financed. Um, generally speaking, we don't know the terms yet, but normally within, you know, over a three-year period. Um, that original proposal was $866,000. Um, Ms. Lim, our um, technology director who serv uh, provides services to both the school department and to us, um, has been constantly negotiating that contract and those services and evaluating them and came back with a recommendation to decrease that of $117,575. Um, the most significant portion, um, or a big portion of that, is also a realignment of the um, user fee that was um, part of that discussion. I believe the original proposal was a $20 user fee, um, and then um, I believe it, it settled at $40, $60, excuse me, at $60. And I could be wrong on the first number. Tom, you can correct me. I think it's 25 and 60. 25 and 60. Thank you. Um, so that was where that primary decrease came from regarding that project. And you'll hear some more information later as well. Thank you, Sean, for your update. Now, before we get any further, um, I do need to offer, um, and more to come to complicate things, I need a motion. I'm offering a motion to divide the question. I move to divide the question to consider the proposed adjustments to the education capital budget as a separate matter. So operating and capital will be two separate items. And again, that's in a form of a motion. And I need a second. Second. And all those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep. So um, <laughs> can you explain why? Um, because in about two seconds I'm going to um, make a disclosure statement. So um, I would um, 
so I don't want to seem uh, being uh, somewhat obstructive here, but um, I know what that motion is going to be, <laughs> and I think it should be made known because I don't, I don't believe that you have a conflict. Well, we'll, um, so, well but she's asking us well, to, uh, well, and I don't think that, I don't think it needs to be divided. I, I, well, procedurally, that's how does. we have to move okay. forward. So I know. I just don't want to be offended if I vote no, against it. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the the motion is to divide the two. Um, is there any other discussion? And all those in favor? And now I do, uh, and opposed is Sean. Uh, so now I do have to, um, and, and Jean Marie will be filling in here for, for this exact moment as a um, collector of the whole staff. I'm making a disclosure that I have a personal financial conflict of interest with the capital program. Um, I, I do have the upper level conflict where, of course, I do have two children in the system, both of whom would benefit from a laptop. But I have an additional conflict with my son. I will have a direct personal financial gain by this program moving forward. My son, unfortunately, um, has some educational needs. And I recently had uh, a meeting for him and in order to attain his access to audio, which he needs for his learning. I will need to provide it as a parent. Therefore, I have a direct financial conflict of interest. So, with that being said, I am offering my recusal from the capital improvement. Is that in the form of a motion? No, I think procedurally Lord, it's the duty of counsel, a counselor to state either a real or perceived conflict. Right. It's then the responsibility of the remaining body, you right. six, to decide whether, yeah. based on that disclosure, there is reason for uh, abstention from the vote. So no, no motion is required. No motion required. We just go right to the vote. Uh, you may wish to have some okay, discussion, discussion on that. Discussion. Discussion. Anybody? Why well, don't I? Personally, I don't think that you would let that influence your vote, but I do actually understand, and if I was in your position, I would probably do the same thing. We're trying to keep this <laughs> as clean and transparent as possible, so I completely understand why you're um, disclosing that information. Anybody else? Sean? So any parent that, uh, that sits on the board that has a child in the high school, is there a financial conflict for that? I'm trying to understand. That's not what she said. I'm asking the question. That I'm not, I'm asking Are you asking question. as a rhetorical question? Not rhetorical. I need to understand. Because the conflict of interest under state law says you have to have a 10% um, position within any tip, typical item as a financial gain. So the 10% is that you'd have to have a financial gain of more than $100,000 or, in this instance, $80,000. I believe the term is um, perceived. Yeah, there's two standards. One is a real conflict and the other is perceived. I would char char characterize the disclosure as a perceived conflict, which is the more difficult one to ascertain. And the conflict is because you have kids in the system who will benefit from uh, the funding of this budget? your personal business out there in the world. Um, I, I have two children. Um, my oldest is in the high school. Obviously, she would, she would benefit from the use of a private laptop. I have a second child who will be entering the high school and has specific educational needs. And in order to meet some of his accommodations, I was informed at our annual meeting that I would need to provide him with that device for his accommodations as the parent. I would suspect that there's been many members of town council who have had children in the school right. systems who have never perceived that as a conflict, uh, and they just called it the way they saw it. Right. Uh, and you're a person of tremendous integrity, so hmm. Second thing. I would not vote to have you recused under these circumstances. Any, anybody down that end? Anybody down? I'll add my, I'm going to be like Jessica, I'm going to add my two cents, go ahead. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I would agree with Bill. Um, I, I, I think you're a person of the utmost integrity. I applaud you for bringing up what you saw as a perceived necessity to recuse yourself from a vote on the computers. Um, I, I don't feel that you need to recuse yourself in this situation because it's a benefit for not just you, but for everybody who's got kids in the high school. So that's where I come from with that. Okay. 
Anybody else? So uh, can we put it to a vote? Yes. Um, all of those who are in favor of Jessica Holbrook recusing herself from this, please vote in the affirmative. Anybody voting yes? How many voting no? Unanimous. Well, good. I can say I just closed <laughs> it. Good. You can go back to taking over. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So on to, um, we divided the question, so the first one is operating. Is there any discussion on the operating side of the, any discussion on the operating side of the motion? Um, looking up and down, looking down, and seeing none. So all those in favor of the operating, as recommended by finance, that's three, four, four. Can we do that again? Okay. All those in favor of the operating for the school? One, two, three, four, five. And opposed is two. And on to the second part of the divided question is capital. And is there any discussion on that item? Or that part of the motion? Sean. I just want to mention that um, hopefully you can hear me now, even in my bad, bad voice. Um, there, there was some discussion about whether or not this was more appropriately placed within the operating budget given the nature of technology in today's environment um, or, um, or using the financing tool that's being recommended as part of the capital budget. And um, personally, I want to um, suggest that I think it's appropriate as an, as an initial outlay within the financing structure that's being recommended. Um, the Town Council's Finance Committee will be looking at um, uh, future policy regarding capital budgets um, and capital projects and how to really better define what is appropriate and what is acceptable within each. It's not just about the schools, by the way, it's also about the towns. Um, so I, I do want people to understand that. Um, and, the, and the fact is that this is the initial outlay. Whether or not future expenditures towards this one-on-one -on -one program goes within the CIP versus within the operating budget, I think is a um, very useful conversation at that time in about two years when we're looking at that again in the next budget. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else on the capital wish to have some conversations? Sure, sir. Oh. Uh, I just want to go on the record that I agree with Sean uh, that for the initial outlay, um, it makes sense to put it under the capital budget. Uh, I certainly encourage the Finance Committee and the Town Council to be looking at what should be capital and capital budgets in the future also. But for this purpose, I'm perfectly happy with doing it this way. All right. Anybody else want to sign in? All right. Well, in dives me. Um, certainly, I've had um, a lot of mixed feelings about this. Um, I will say I do feel a little more confident that this is the startup of the program and that there is a parent buy-in. Um, so over time, there is a fund that can accrue and grow. Um, I will say, um, and I would seriously discourage any future council continuing to, to do this through a budget process. I appreciate in, in a capital bond scenario. Um, certainly, this is the ongoing cost of doing business. Um, certainly, we don't bond for our textbooks. We don't bond for, you know, I mean, we bond for the big ticket, like a fire truck, for the initial startup purchase, but we don't bond for the tires and the hoses and all those things as they get replaced. It's the cost of doing business. So, um, although it's a rather large and bitter pill for myself to swallow, I, I'll, I'll, I'll believe in that the, the investment in the startup needs to be there. Um, but again, it, it's my sincere hope that moving forward into next year. Uh, again, the, these are not items you find in capital as a bond. They're, they're allocations. So um, with that, we're on um, number two, which is capital. Is there anybody else? All right, and seeing none, all those in favor? There's four, five, six, seven, unanimous. Well, okay. Madam Chair? Yes. If I could, um, just to, uh, as an ancillary piece of information, with that action, I did want to at least um, put out onto the table what the net impact of that um, action is before any further, if you don't mind. Would that be wise? Yeah. You, can, are you good, Brittany? You want Tom to read it? I'm good. <laughs> okay. 
I'm Get good. worse as you go. It's the talking <laughs> thing, hey, you know, your chance to keep me quiet. Um, um, sorry. So um, with both of those uh, motions and adjustments and approvals, the total budget for the town of Scarborough is $59,295,168. As part of that budget, we are also estimating that the assessed valuation, which again is also a moving target um, because we won't know what that will be, is approximately three million, sorry, three billion seven hundred and fifteen million four hundred and eighty nine thousand seven hundred dollars. That will produce a net mill rate of fifteen dollars and ninety six cents. The net impact is a five point six nine percent increase over this year's fifteen dollars and ten cents. On for that information. So, next on the packet, I'd like to offer a motion. This would be motion number three in your spiel here. So, in the form of a motion, move approval to add $50,000 to the municipal budget for the purpose of funding outside agency requests, the specific recipients to be identified by the Rules and Policy Committee, and the final allocation to be decided on by the Finance Committee for a new net budget of $17,721,601. And that's in the form of a motion. Second. And um, before we jump off into discussion, I wrote some notes, if you could give me a minute to skim back here a little bit. Um, I know there was some discussion about, um, in, in the final, I'm, I'm breaking, I, I, I answered it. A media question saying I wasn't going to offer an amendment, and here I am. Um, I, I did just want to bring this up. I know there was some some kind of low and light level discussion in finance about what what are these and what's our criteria. Uh, my thought here was that uh, rather than eliminating all of them, and um, certainly I wouldn't necessarily disagree <coughs> that they're not all essential services, which is what our goal was, but certainly some of them are vitally important. So my thought here was to hold the placeholder for the funding at the level which is what was dispersed last year. Um, my experience right here on the council, the funding for outside agencies has been held at flatline level for the last three or four anyway, unless I'm mistaken, Tom. No, close. Um, so again, to have the placeholder, and then again, we can review the policy of how we come upon who gets what and why, and that can get punted to the Finance Committee for a total allocation. Um, the, I do want to touch base um, a little bit. I, I didn't go through all of them, but, but on our SharePoint site, there is some information that um, is on there that has to do with what these agencies are and, and what is it, because that conversation has popped up a little bit, too, along the way. Um, why are we giving money to, you know, when, you know, donating money and, and that sort of thing um, to charities? Uh, these aren't exactly charities. They, 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 these are grants more, more than they are a donation. Certainly, again, reads across America isn't necessarily as, as essential to the health and well-being of our community, but, but some of these other programs are. And, and what some of our funds do when, when we talk about outside agencies are, for instance, the RTP service. So again, that's the, you know, the little white buses that you see that, that pick up people. Um, there are 141 Scarborough residents that receive services from RTP. Um, that's 16,300 trips or 182,000 miles performed last year, bringing residents of Scarborough to and from doctor's appointments, groceries, those sorts of things. Um, their ability, our, our, our fund, which is we fund $3,000 for that, or $3,500,000, $3,500, sorry, gives them the ability to leverage and, and uh, get local matches to, to leverage federal and state funds. So it's actually a, a double whammy if we don't fund, fund that for them. Um, other, another company is Hospice of Southern Maine. Um, certainly, again, that's for Scarborough, means a $1,300 investment. This is the Gosnell House, um, at home, inpatient at the hospital. These people are, unfortunately, six months or less of a life expectancy, and there are 94 patients in Scarborough that were serviced and 208 families that were serviced for bereavement services. So, again, you know, there's a kind of public issue of someone's bereaved, they can things can go south quick. Um, and, and last one I'll talk about is Opportunity Alliance. Again, 
just um, you know, there are, like I said, a multitude of these, but, but just to kind of give an idea, um, Opportunity and Alliance is kind of a gateway service. They administer um, WIC, better known as Women, Infants, Children. That's your baby formula. That's, that's uh, milk and eggs and those sorts of things. Um, they also help administer the CHIP heat, which is fuel, um, money, and repairs and maintenance. Um, again, all told, they service 229 residents here in Scarborough. Um, for the for the chip heat, 108 for WIC. Um, of all the services that they, they oversee, there were 2,496 Scarborough residents that received services for a total cash value of $520,000 and 20, uh, 520,024 for our $8,000 investment. So again, these are vital services that, that have a huge impact on those that, that receive them. Um, <coughs> And that's hopefully a little explanation as to what some of these do. So with that, is there any other discussion? Peter? Yeah, I guess I guess where I would be is I'm not charities are something that people take very personally. And I think people should be able to choose where their monies go to which charities they want to choose. I don't think it's the role of town council, I don't think it's the role of a municipality to determine how taxpayers should contribute to charities. So I don't support that the town adding this back into the budget to get charities. As I look down through the list, some of the biggest chunks of these monies are actually going to home health visiting nurses that are part of very profitable health systems like Bain Health System, Mercy Hospital. So I would be opposed to adding 50000 back into the budget. I, I think that's a personal choice of whatever charities people want to support. Thank you. Uh, Jim Marie? Uh, I was at a meeting with Greater Portland Council of Governments not too long ago, and we were just looking at various municipal budgets. Um, Scarborough has probably, no, I shouldn't say probably, it does have the lowest general assistance budget uh, or expenditures out of all of the communities that are in Greater Portland Council of Governments. And I, I give great credit in particular to Project Grace for that. Um, so we're not spending money under the general assistance. Um, but I also know it's because of some of these other programs. So for me, this is a, a great investment in the people in our community who need help. And, and I'm going to throw a question back at the chair just as a reminder, if I'm understanding this correctly, what you're saying, this is a placeholder amount? Yes. And then we haven't decided, we're going to have the Finance Committee decide to whom the money will go. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But, but so again, I would support that. Again, that goes back to I, I don't think the finance committee of a town council should decide where charitable money from taxpayers go. I think that's a personal choice. Oh. Uh, I, I will support this by virtue of the way you've phrased it to run through right. policies and finance. Uh, I do think we, uh, Peter's point is well taken in that we do need to have a, a sound policy as to why we are doing what we're doing with this line item. Uh, and I think we are, uh, we're obligated to evaluate what are the factors that would cause us to fund uh, grant monies or not fund grant monies for different entities. Uh, in the case of Project Grace, uh, it's been recognized that there is an enormous uh, unburdening of the town's uh, general assistance by virtue of the work they do. And therefore, there is a return on investment uh, there. Uh, but is that true for all of the entities? Uh, are larger entities perhaps looking at our funding as being relatively inconsequential? Those are some of the factors that I think need to be evaluated. So I will support your motion. But, but a point of clarity, too. Project Grace, Grace, as I understand it, is still in our budget. There is money in there for Project Grace, as there was last year in the budget without this yeah. motion. That's right. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yeah, I'll say something. Okay. Uh, I don't necessarily look at these as, um, I think I want to phrase this. Um, I don't necessarily look at these as charities. I, I understand that that's what they are. Um, but I look at these as other ways for us to give back to our community. Um, a lot of these programs support 
some of our elderly population, and we don't have very much support for our elderly population. In fact, we have about zero in this town. Um, so for me, I understand, and I also would agree that this is a, these are placeholders. These are not um, exact amounts of what we're what is going to be given to these charities. Um, I would I could probably personally tweak a couple of them, but um, I think it's a, I feel strongly that it is another way to give back to uh, an area of our community that really basically sees nothing. Anybody else? I'm just uh, I'm not sure if it helps anyone, but really the issue before you tonight is whether you appropriate a sum of money. Great. And this motion has a body a, a group of this the subset of this group to make the decision. You may choose to allocate nothing or some part of that. But again, the, the question this evening is uh, is really just the appropriation. Without that, you can't even have that next level conversation. Thank you for speaking more eloquently than me. <laughs> sure. And anybody else? All right. Seeing none. All those in favor? It is one, two, three, four, five, six. And I pull. <coughs> And Peter is. All right, on to motion number four, which goes to Councilor Bayline. So I'll, I'll I'll make the motion, but uh, the manager, I'm going to ask if through the chair to, for some assistance in the explanation. Um, so for the formality is uh, move approval to reduce appropriations in the educational capital budget as amended by $41,000 and reduce educational capital budget revenues by a similar amount due to, a, due to reduced costs related to the high school one-to-one -one laptop project. Um, I can give a high level and then Tom, uh, Tom could provide the lower level if you don't mind. Um, it's my understanding that our technology director and her uh, daily job has been obviously continuously looking at the contract, talking to. I'm sorry. Do you need one? Oh, we need a second. Sorry. We're going to wait. Oh, that's okay. We're going to finish. Can I have a second? Second. Sorry. All right, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I want, just want to get the talking done and over with. Yeah. High on uh, Ricola cost, cost drops. Um, <laughs> So uh, our technology director is consistent, constantly looking at the contract and negotiating and talking to the vendor. So the primary issue is that the cost per device has gone down based upon the re a new negotiated amount. And the, um, I believe the original amount per unit was $459, if my memory serves, and she was able to renegotiate a price of $413. Um, and with that, uh, Tom can provide right. any further details if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, that's the bulk of the, uh, the, the savings. Apparently there were some modifications on the ADP cost, that's the actual accidental damage protection, but the net result of those uh, negotiations produce, produces a $41,000 um, savings, if you will. That combined with um, what you accepted under Motion 2, it's about $160,000 change uh, for this program from the time it was uh, introduced in the proposed budget to this evening. All right, so we have a first and a second. Is there any discussion? I'm looking up, I'm um, looking down, now I see none. All those in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Unanimous. All right. And number five is Councilor Hayes. Yeah, and I guess I'm, I'm moving to approve to reduce the education bu budget as amended in the amount of $250,000. And, and my thinking for that is, as we look back historically where we've been for surpluses, in the last three years we've generated on average about 270000 in surpluses for the 2014-2015 year, which is virtually over, and we're 11 months in. Um, we heard from the school administration that they're pretty comfortable that there's a surplus being generated this year. So I'm just suggesting that we take that surplus that we are going to generate this year and give taxpayers some relief this year instead of later years. Should not impact any of the program and being offered or services, but that was sort of the rationale and the reason for the proposal to reduce it to $250,000 to approximate the surplus for the 2014-2015 year. All right, so that was a form of a for motion. The for but the purposes of discussion, I'll second the motion. Oh, sorry. Done. <laughs> all right, and discussion. Are you all set? Yeah, I think I've that? already discussed it. Yeah. <laughs> I was just checking. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just, is there any other discussion on John? Yeah. I so, um, oh, sorry. No. Um, 
So um, this was uh, uh, was actually discussed in some context at the Finance Committee level at a different value. And so um, um, while I understand um, the theory behind this, I'm a little bit nervous about the practicality. Um, the, the reason is that we're basing this motion and this request on a projected amount of surplus that isn't absolute at this particular time. And for me, it's about consistency and application of methodology. And what that is is that um, we did not discuss the same opportunity that could be provided on the town side. Instead, we, we were very specific in looking at only factual data and not projections. So I think that um, from, a, from a practicality perspective is that this is unaligned with how we approach both budgets. Um, and the fact is that we don't know where that budget is. I think based upon conversations that the, the theory behind it is probably accurate. But we also talked about at that committee level is about how do we use fund balance going forward and really stabilizing the use of that so that it softens um, what we believe will be a very tumultuous next three years regarding not only the school's budget but the town's budget. Um, I mean, it's pretty clear that next year there's going to be some significant adjustments at the county level. There will probably be some major adjustments at the state level regarding our own um, GPA and, the, and tuition, um, or I should say student um, revenues, uh, revenues for students. And I don't think that this is a really a, a practical approach to the theory that's being applied. Anybody else want to give me? Yeah, um, I I would not support this particular motion. Um, I followed pretty closely um, what went on with the finance committee, the various both of the finance committees uh, working together, um, and for all of the reasons stated by Councillor Babine, um, I think that no, doesn't make sense to me. Okay. Um, Kate, first, and then Bill. Um, I just want some clarity, I guess. I, are, are you telling me that you're predicting in the next couple of years that we're going to see more of an increase in our taxes? I mean, that's basically what you're saying. Is that correct? Councillor Behind? <laughs> so I'm, I just want to make sure I'm hearing you clearly at, so or, or I understand so exactly what you're saying. So if this is a question through the chair, I'm not used to this uh, uh, back and forth, well, so I'd be happy to answer the well, question. Well, I, I, I'm asking the question. Yep. Um, I believe my statement was that I'm expecting revenue sources coming from the state to decrease, and the impact of the county budget is also going to have an impact on us. How we resolve that is undetermined at this time. Uh, yeah. You want that? Yeah. Bill? This is really a question of uh, use of fund balance. Uh, we had an extensive discussion. Increase the use of fund balance monies, which uh, I think is it should be done very conservatively. Uh, in uh, this particular case, what we're trying to do is anticipate uh, future fund balances. So uh, that aspect uh, concerns me. But more than anything, uh, I felt I had reached the limits of the use of fund balance monies uh, when we uh, brought the uh, uh, $225,000 figure forward in the Finance Committee. Uh, that was as much of those that source of funds for revenue purposes that I was comfortable using. It brought us down to the 8.3% uh, figure that we have as a policy. And so I'm, uh, I would at this point not support the motion. John. Kitty can go first and she hasn't. Oh. Go ahead, John. You may lose your voice. Between now and now. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, two pieces. To further explain um, the comment that I made, um, I mean, the two pieces that I focused in on was uh, first is the GPA um, and the state funds that we received. Um, had a chance to sit down with uh, Senator Millett, who represents a portion of Scarborough with the chair of the Finance Committee for the school board, and it's very clear that um, the methodology is that it's based on, really that allocation is based on two factors. The first is the three-year average of our student enrollment, and the second piece is on the valuation of the community. And in a community that continuously um, is increasing in value, I don't expect that number to stay flat. If anything, I expect it to continue to grow even greater than the $15 million that we're projecting in next year's budget. 
So assuming that that constantly will increase, as it does, if you then look at the three-year average, um, the numbers based upon the average and the change is that the, the one year that will fall off is actually our best year. And depending upon what our final numbers are for this year, the average is actually going to continue to decrease. And when you have decreasing student enrollment and you have um, increasing state evaluations or state valuations, you're going to have decreasing state funding. What that dollar amount is, whether it's the million dollars that we re were cut this year or whether it's more, is the unpredictable part. And so I'm using the, um, the, uh, the understanding that we're looking to um, level services budget uh, for both the town and the schools at, at the finance committee level, not knowing where the revenue is going to come in right now because it is a projection. So if they do use that all or use all of that, then the $250,000 is a decrease in level services, which I think just from theoretically is unacceptable if we're not looking at the same on the municipal side. So I'm looking at this from a fair and balanced perspective using some of that data that was presented. Yeah, and I guess, and, and, and I think this kind of goes to Council Donna, that this is not really necessarily about fund balance. It was only a part of a conversation holder. What I'm trying to mm -hmm. take account of, and, and certainly our inboxes have been flooded by issues on both sides, people that support the school budget or not, but what we're looking at is a 7.7% .7 increase in the school budget. This is at least some way to give some relief. I got to believe, based on the process we went through, that the 250 somewhere within the school budget, that probably can be accommodated without causing any disruption of services and other things. So it's really an issue of do we listen to the taxpayers? In the past, we sent it to the polls. If, if taxpayers think that this budget is too low, um, they can certainly vote it down and say they want it to be higher. But I think. You know, when I look at this, this is still a huge issue for some of our residents in this community, and I don't know how it's going to play out, but that's, it's really trying, this, this is still a significant impact for many households, and, and what does it come out to be? It's still about 300 bucks a house. So for a $300,000 house, the tax rate, um, where is it? It's on the total. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's $258 increase still for our $300,000 home. So I was trying to accommodate sort of that concept with this also. Uh, Last time I promised. <laughs> uh, well, there was one piece like this, you know, with this, uh, um, the other uh, portion when I mentioned before was about the county tax. So the finance committee also had a meeting with our county commissioner and the county manager. Um, and it's clear that depending on the outcome of Augusta is that if the state budget is approved according to the governor's proposal, there will be a $4.5 million shift from the state to the county level regarding the cost of running the jail. The net of that is that it would actually increase our current allotment, which is about a 5% increase. It will increase next year to 13%. So it will go from about 250000 to a little over $500,000. So I'm looking at both of those costs. So I wanted to mention that. Peter, I, I think your point is actually extremely valid. The issue, though, is that at the same time, while we have constituents who are asking for us to present um, what they would consider the best position, being the lowest position possible, um, I think that the community will accept and endorse the budget as it is. And if anything, if that, act, if that theory is incorrect, this to me is maybe a negotiated position to fall back to. Okay. If this is not a, uh, a fund balance question, a revenue question, but rather a budget uh, expense question, uh, at the Finance Committee, uh, I pushed forward a $90,000 cut because I thought that was the amount that uh, uh, in the uh, uh, education improvement plan submitted by the school, represented uh, new further uh, efforts in programs and that the balance of those funds, this was a $335,000 item, really were level services. And I thought that our council had made it pretty clear that uh, uh, shooting for level services was an important goal of this year, that the schools would be held to that standard in my view uh, in the same fashion that the town was. 
Uh, and so uh, the amount that was arrived at in motion two, which uh, approved that not, uh, as a part of the adjustment, that $90,000 cut in the school budget, mm -hmm. that arrived at the point that I thought was appropriate. Anybody else? All right, my turn. So um, on Peter's motion, so I, I, I did seriously think about it when, when I saw um, this evening that you were going to be moving this motion forward and I was reading it and I, and I did seriously contemplate it. The only problem I have is that um, we have at this point, if I'm not mistaken, and I did hear it again this evening, already dipped down to what our policy is on the bare minimum for fund balance. Um, certainly, I think 250 is probably a little more palatable to some to, to reduce the budget a little further. Um, I, I do want to, as much as I would really like to support it, I find myself falling a little short just because I think we are level services right now. Um, and, and I did speak to this um, a couple days ago is that if we want to provide level services, it's, it's, it's the budget you have in front of you. And I am comfortable with, with sending that to the voter and, and hearing what the voter has to say. Uh, I am not going to say that we are right. That's the point of sending it out to the voter. I, I want to hear if we are right. If, 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 if that's what the goal of the community is, is to maintain essential services, they will vote and they will support it. If they do not and, and they feel that we should be reducing our services some, um, I, I think we'll be here. The other thing I might like to add is, again, timetable-wise, um, I'm a little leery. I, I know it's tempting to look at, at it will say that you're you're in 11 months and, and think you can spend it to the 12-month projection, but um, the adage of you don't count your chickens before they're hatched, um, we would be a little closer. You know, again, if the first budget fails a referendum, we would be a little closer. We'd be at almost year end, and and I'd be there. You know, I, I really would be um, in, in supporting it, but. Um, certainly not right at this exact moment. Um, so, but but thank you for bringing it forward and, and, and to have it as a great discussion point. Um, so, with that, on the motion, all any other discussion? All right, saying none. All those in favor? We've got two, and all those opposed? One, two, three, four, five. On to number six. Councillor Blaze, you have something for us. Uh, <clears throat> Once again, I'm very disappointed at the fact that we're sending out to the voters and the people, the taxpayers in the town, a budget that's going to increase taxes 5.69%. Year after year after year, we don't come anywhere near the CPI. Last year we came pretty close. We came to 2.2%. But our taxes have gone up 24.3% in the last three years, or last five years. And if you throw in this one, it's going to be 26.4% over the, this coming year and previous four years. While the CPI has only gone up 8.5%. That's three and a half times the CPI. We're driving people out of town. This town has got to somehow figure out how to manage their respective businesses so it can be affordable for people. We can't continue to ask people for huge increases. During the whole process, I didn't see too many people stand up and say, well, I'll give up this or I'll give up that. And we've got to do that. We've got to start doing that. My motion is move approval to reduce the municipal budget as amended by $204,206 and to reduce the education budget as amended by $616,342, the purpose of which is to remove funding for cost of living increases for all town and school employees. All right. 
So that was in the form of a motion. Is there a second? Second for purposes of discussion. Okay. And discussion. And anybody? All right. Well, um, I suppose I will tackle that. that. <laughs> um, I, I, I think I'm just going to mimic my comments from earlier um, on the last motion, although I do greatly and, 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 and profoundly appreciate you having this um, for us to discuss tonight. Um, I, I do just want to note that um, at this point in time, uh, although I can't support it for now, um, I, I think the intent is to bring, bring in the reduction um, so that the rate comes down. Um, certainly, um, it, it's not quite as simple as removing the cost of living um, because we would be breaking contract, more or less, um, and, and be violating it. Um, which could actually be very costly to litigate. Uh, but I think the underlying principle here was to um, try to bring down spending, and, and I do applaud that. Um, again, I, I'm not there um, as of yet. I, I really want to hear from the public. It's, And I also, um, although somebody said they were counting emails, so I'm, I'm getting a whole lot of them. Um, I don't gauge how many people send me an email as the will <laughs> of, of a community as a whole. Uh, so I really am truly, it's not a political statement, it's not jargon, I really am truly looking forward to seeing what happens with the referendum because that is a very clear and precise message as to where the community as a whole wants to, to move forward with too. So um, again, I, I just want to say I do applaud you for the effort, uh, um, Ed, but I, I don't support it. Um, Sean. I had to get through half a cough drop before I could speak. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, so, you know, just to reiterate what uh, Councillor Holbrook had mentioned, you know, we enter into contract negotiations, um, and they're all over the place in the sense that the timing, so some contracts within both budgets may have been, um, may have just been entered into, some could have been a year ago. There's all different timelines. But we enter into them with good faith and with honesty, and I think that um, adhering to those is extremely important, especially in times of um, difficulty, even financial difficulty on behalf of the community. Secondarily is, if I remember correctly, both municipal and town budgets regarding COLA or regarding um, increases, um, the net of 2% um, was consistent for both, which is consistent with current marketplace changes. It is not an inconsistent approach. So I don't see that either, either uh, budgets are inconsistent. And in fact, based upon the negotiated level, we received a significant reduction in other expenses that has been realized over time that included health care and a realignment of health care at the school department as well as negotiated contracts at the town and, and health care benefits that were negotiated at that level. So there's a, um, you know, there's a, a balancing act here between both uh, compensation as well as other benefits that are honestly negotiated into. So I could not support this particular motion. And anybody else? Okay, sure. Um, I <coughs> also completely understand what Councillor Blaze is trying to accomplish. Um, you know, in a perfect world, the schools would get exactly what they want and the municipality would get exactly what we want. I mean, I think we're, this is the third or fourth year that we've now tried to get nine positions and you haven't even asked for them because we can't, we just can't do it. We can't keep doing this stuff. Um, it's frustrating. I actually hate this time of year. I like being counselor, but this is one of the, worst times of year because no matter what we decide to do, somebody's going to be upset or somebody's going to go without. And that's a hor horrifying position to be in. Um, so I understand what my fellow counselors are trying to do. I, I have to agree with Councillor Holbrook. I'm, I, I feel like it needs to go to a referendum. I think the town needs to speak. Um, I think when things this large come up, and we've seen this in other issues, I think our town has a right to vote on it. It's not up to the seven of us or the seven members of the school board to make the decisions for the entire town. Um, we are here to make recommendations, as is the school board, uh, but I do believe it's up to the town to come out and vote and show how you feel about it. Um, I also don't count emails. I know we've been flooded um, for both sides of it, and people have really compelling 
arguments for both sides. I mean, I, I can read an email and get done reading it and think, absolutely, this person just nailed it, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. And then I read two more emails later, and they are just as compelling. Um, we have to take care of our people in this town, and that means everybody. So I, w I would like to see this go to a vote. Um, I hope that's what happens tonight. Um, done. I'm Thank done. you. Anybody else on the motion? All right. All those in favor? One. And opposed? Six. Okay. So, those are um, the last of the amendments that I am aware of. Um, so, I thought I would just throw that out there. So, the last I had paperwork for. <laughs> uh, <laughs> certainly, we have somebody can add another if, if they were so inclined. Um, or we can just have back to the main motion and, and some discussion. So, um, that's where well, nobody's jumping up and down. So, anybody want to discuss? No. no. On the main motion. On the main motion. Uh, As amended. Uh, it has been a difficult year, and I really was searching for a standard uh, for the overall budget, both municipal and, and the school. We have the overall school responsibility uh, and work very closely with the finance committee of the school department this year very successfully to understand what we were supposed to do in an overall sense. Uh, the uh, way I've approached it is that we're in a tough situation. We, it was not of our own making. Uh, we've lost millions and millions of dollars over the year in school funding and town funding uh, from the state. Uh, that's, you know, there's no use crying over spill milk. Uh, the money has been taken away from us, and we've been asked to make it up. Uh, so uh, that's, that's just reality. So... Under those circumstances, I don't think we should be uh, uh, adding programs, but I don't think we should be trying to undo or dismantle uh, the programs. We should be still providing what the town expects in terms of essential services, level service funding. And that's what uh, both at the town level we asked the town manager to, to do, and he did very successfully. Uh, uh, you're, you'll find there are no... Uh, expansions of programs other than public safety and we have a relatively modest inclusion in the fire department budget for public safety uh, which we scrutinized rather carefully it is a totally level services budget we did the same with the school finance committee uh, and came to the conclusion that uh, everything except about ninety thousand dollars uh, in their budget was level services, that they too embraced the same concept that this is not the time to be expanding. Uh, and when people say, well, it's too much of a jump, well, we all agree with that. It, it is. It's a staggering amount. And, and we've got to weather this period because it isn't necessarily just this year. Uh, as Councillor Baybine points out, we've got some substantial risk of increases next year in the county budget, which we just, we don't have any say over. We just pay. Uh, uh, we have risks at the state level, again, to lose funding. Uh, and so uh, we have to weather this period. But I do think that there is going to be a period in the years to come where we can get truly a low stable budget. Now, people say, why not uh, 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 arrive at uh, the CPI, which we all know has been historically low in recent years. And, that's, uh, and there, is a, there is a good answer. People should understand. Schools and municipalities aren't a reflection of the consumer price index. Uh, they are about 75% employee driven. Uh, whereas the CPI has the whole panoply of goods and services that make up our uh, country's economy. And that includes things that uh, all of us recognize. Uh, one thing I've always kind of marveled at is how computers don't cost any more today than they cost decades ago. There's a, uh, I, looked at, I looked it up because I was curious to know the, uh, how 
technology and automation has kept our cost of living down uh, at these historically low rates. There's a principle called Moore's Law that says every two years, computer chip capacity doubles. So you go out t the last 20 years, that's 2,000 times as much computer uh, uh, computing capacity as, as, as existed uh, 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 20 years ago. It's extraordinary that, that we could have that and the price of, of, of technology, uh, electronic instruments and computers is essentially the same. Uh, uh, and so there's a reason why our cost of living could be at 1.7. But when you look at schools primarily, they're more in the three to four percent range. And anybody who's experienced healthcare costs over the last 10 years knows that they've been going up at eight to 10 percent every single year. So you take a two or three percent contract with your employees for uh, uh, their raise, which two to three percent, pretty modest. Uh, and then you layer onto it a, a health care benefit that's going up at 8 to 10 percent. And it's very easy to see why all of a sudden you're not talking about 1.7 CPI, you're talking about uh, 3 or 4 percent every year. And we should realize that. The debate shouldn't be over CPI, it should be over what, is, what are municipalities and what do schools traditionally have for cost of living adjustments. Uh, uh, but ultimately, the biggest question is, are we being taxed too much? Uh, the rate, yes, the rate uh, should be more stable than it is, and I hope that in the years to come that we can stabilize it to a greater degree. But the bigger question is, are we over, uh, being overtaxed? Uh, well, there's data, and, and the data is particularly focused upon schools. Our school system is right in the middle of all Maine averages. In Maine, we're not talking about a wealthy state. Uh, all these smaller communities, uh, uh, when you average them all out, we're paying uh, per pupil about the same amount as is the average across the entire state. And those numbers come out of the state of Maine. Now, these are not numbers that, that we do. And when you look at the subparts to that, you go, well, wait a sec, uh, where are we, are we paying too much for administrators? But no, we're below average for administrators, uh, below the state average. Uh, we're above average in, uh, uh, in teaching. Well, that's exactly what you'd want. Put the money into teachers. I hear that a hundred times when I, when I hear from people who are, who are talking about the budget. Where are we way above average? Debt service. And you say, well, why are we way above average in debt service? Well, look at the example of the town of Sanford. They are building a $100 million high school. You know how much they're paying for that out of their own taxpayer funds? $10 million. $90 million of it is paid for by the state. We have a gorgeous new school, uh, Wentworth School, and it costs about $40 million. You know how much the state paid uh, out of that? A big goose egg, zero. We, the taxpayers of Scarborough, are gonna pay for that $40 million. So you, when you start to say, well, why is our debt service so high? It's because we've been paying for our own improvements, uh, unlike a lot of other communities. The money is given out on the basis of communities that are in need. The perception uh, and the standards that are applied are that we are less in need and therefore we have to go it alone. So those are, those are the kinds of things that I want people to understand. We are not being overtaxed. The schools are being run exceptionally well, really extraordinary. There is no school uh, system in the state with 3,000 students or more who ranks above us. Uh, we are absolutely number one. So uh, just realize uh, what a tremendous gift we have. And when you think about what really influences people to come to live in a community, what's the number one reason? The school systems.
Uh, and so why are we being penalized by the state and their funding formula? Because our values are going up faster than other communities are going up. So it may be little solace to people who are having to pay out two or $300 more in taxes. But what you have to realize is if you just make a 1% increase above everybody else each year, a 1% increase in value on your home, if you've got the average home of $300,000, well, that's a $3,000 increase in value. Most people would say, well, a couple of hundred bucks on the tax rate to get a $3,000 return on investment. That's not bad math. So, thank you. Thank you. And... So, um, first, I, I really want to stress that I've been extremely appreciative of all the feedback that I've received. Um, I, too, did not count uh, emails um, um, or conversations or the sources of uh, where I got that, but the great piece is that I got that information from just about every source possible, which includes <laughs> Hannaford's, McDonald's. Every time I walked into some place, I got some feedback. So. Um, it was really nice, uh, especially on a Sunday shopping uh, with the wife, you know, you get stopped in the middle of the Prado style and told what um, someone's opinion is about the budget is always a unique experience. Um, but it's the experience that I asked for, so I, I can't really complain. Um, but this process over the time that I've been able to serve has never been easy and it gets more and more difficult every year. So I do want to stress to my colleagues on the Finance Committee, uh, Peter and Bill, thank you for making that experience, and especially Tom and Ruth. Um, extremely useful, um, very worthwhile, and I continue to learn more and more as part of that process um, because of your questions and your in-depth insight into that. So I do appreciate that. Um, what I do want to answer, at least as part of uh, one question, is that, uh, so of course, um, as you go along in any debate, uh, sometimes people will ask questions for the purpose of either trying to ignite a uh, more heated debate or try to become personal and somewhat demeaning in some sense. So I do want to answer a, a few questions. You know, um, the fortunate part of being able to have served as long as I have is that I can at least look back and take a look at what my prior positions have been and why, and to try to apply some consistency with that over time. And one of the approaches that I've always looked at from a budget perspective is that whenever there is growth, it really should be the time for an investment. But whenever there is a recession, is really the time on which you put on the constraints. And it seems like that we have consistently, or at least um, irregularly, I should say, um, not really done that. So um, every economic indicator that the state can put out, as well as that we can look at locally, suggests that we are in a full um, economic recovery. Uh, I don't even call it a recovery anymore. It's economic growth. If you look at employment rates, state income tax collection, state sales tax collection, business growth just for, if you want to look at Greater Portland, but even if you look at just Scarborough, even during the recession, Scarborough has consistently grown from a business perspective as well as from a residential perspective. So we have outpaced every other community, hence the reason why we're in somewhat of a difficult situation with the state as it comes down to um, even for our schools and their funding. But yet we're not constantly investing, and because the fact is that we are really in an unreasonable time because um, the volatility that's really happening at the state level regarding their budgets and not knowing um, the severity of what their changes are going to be. So we have to react um, reasonably to that. Um, so one of the questions that I was asked, um, and I think we've all been asked this, is, you know, what do we consider reasonable? Well, obviously, if you were to take a poll, not only of us, but anybody in here, I bet you you can't find a consistent answer to that particular question when it comes to finances or to anything else in life. But one thing that actually really hit me was that one of those grocery store um, comments that I received was, at the very least, be reasonable enough to use common sense. And the fact is that the budget that's been recommended by the Finance Committee and even adjusted makes common sense. It's about level services at a time of um, uncertainty. It's about um, continuing the value of this community that we all uh, cherish. But I hope, if anything, that it sets as a framework for where we can sit down at all levels and really talk about the value statement of what this community currently has for its services and where do we move forward. Because this isn't, even though the focus has been significantly on the schools, it's not just about the schools. We have a significant critical gap in municipal services as it relates to fire and police. It's absolutely incredible. But yet this year we're only increasing our funding to support that with two full-time 
um, fired um, firemen or fi uh, fire people um, at about fifty thousand dollars for a three month implementation that will obviously increase next year, but yet we have a gap of almost twenty six so it isn 't just about schools and the value of the schools provide to us it 's all about, it's also about the other values and it 's also about the police department, the increasing need for administrative services as the community grows. Um, so one of the things that I, I w did want to suggest is that as we move forward, that we continue this um, focus, not only at the local level, but particularly at the state level, because constantly, and this is regardless of political party, we have been made promises over time. About 10 years ago, we were made promises that education will be funded at the local level at 55%. Mm -hmm. It has never even reached that. If anything, it has declined. We were told that um, teacher retirement contribution would be funded by the state. They're not even funding it anymore, and they're using what they had funded it, which was about 73%, for other reasons. Nothing related to education, I presume, based upon what they're funding our education currently at. So I hope that we continue that focus and we continue that attention with our state representatives, because they need to be held just as accountable as we are being held accountable for. So um, I actually uh, think that the recommendations that came out this evening are a um, good measure of the community's value. I wish it could be better, um, but given the climate and the level of um, attention and the uncertainty, it is extremely difficult, and I think that we've done an extremely good job. And I think that this is a budget that can be supported by the, by the citizens and will pass. And I'm going to ask them to pass that. Thank you. Um, I'll try to be briefer. Yeah. Too. And yeah, I am the one that was counting emails, so, okay. <laughs> and I also get stopped in Hannaford uh, when I show up. As I've mentioned before frequently, um, from my position here as a town councilor, I call the tale of two Scarboroughs. We're still in this, this period of, you've got the old Scarborough, people who've been here for a long time and have contributed greatly to this town, and then you've got a lot of people, as we say in Maine, from away, who've moved in, and there's a bit of dissonance that goes on um, between the, between the two, two sides, uh, which is too bad, but that's okay, because it lends itself to some creative working together. Um, I think it leads to the process that we had this year, which I was very thankful to see, which was the two finance committees, uh, in particular, getting together and working through issues. I thought that was, that was great. Um, as both of my fellow counselors have reflected on, budgets are a reflection of community values. What you choose to spend as a community in your budgets says something about what you value in the community. And what we have in Scarborough, we have children who are our future. We have the children who are in the schools, and they deserve the best that we can afford to give them, because they are our future. We also have a number of seniors who have paid their dues and deserve all the help and support that they can get also. So the balancing act for us as counselors is to look at the whole picture and do the best we can to come up with a reasonable balance that perpetuates the values that we see that are brought forward to us in the emails and in Hannaford's or any place else we may run into the taxpayers of the town. And it's my job as a counselor to weigh all of this and then come down on the side that I feel is most valuable to us as a town. Um, I, I will be honest with you, I get very frustrated sometimes when I hear from some folks who, I, I don't quite get it, but they sort of have the attitude of, I've got mine, you go get your own. That frustrates me. And on the other side, I get frustrated when I talk to some of my elderly neighbors who don't have anything except for fixed income and live in houses that I worry about the condition of their houses, to be honest, but yet they're saying to me, oh, no, we need to support the schools. So that's, that's what we're dealing with here. And, and Councilor St. Clair, she mentioned that. She said this is a very frustrating uh, time of year. So with that being said, um, 
obviously I'm going to support what we've worked out tonight, <coughs> but I will remind people that the school portion of this budget goes to a referendum on June 9th, so people need to come out and vote. Regardless of what, of what your position is, you need to come out and vote. There will be absentee ballots available when, Cody? They're currently now. Currently now. So you don't have to wait until June 9th. You can come vote. Um, will you be mailing absentee ballots? If they're so you can even get mailed an absentee ballot if you want one. So there's no excuse for people not to vote on these school referendum questions. And I'm talking about parents. I'm talking about people at home. I'm talking about nobody should be too busy to vote because this affects you, this affects your tax rate, it affects our kids, it affects our seniors. So with that, I'm done. Okay. Anybody down here? No? Peter? Yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, you know, I guess for me, I, and I take a look, and I'm pretty goal-oriented, that's sort of where I've been, but you know, one of our goals as a council <coughs> is to try to live within our financial constraints and also try to bring some stability to the tax rates. And I think you've heard the conversations tonight. I mean, we're kind of a microcosm of every place else. Um, this community does have some financial constraints. And I really applaud, you know, Councilors Hank there saying, let's, let's go to the vote. I hope people do come out. There's some real tough choices for the community because as, as Councilor Blaise said, the, you know, our rates have gone up 24, 25% in the last four or five years. Nobody's incomes have gone up at that rate. You heard Council Donovan say oh, it's great because property values are going up, but for a lot of people that are property rich, they have properties on the coast, but maybe cash poor, the only way they can harvest that increase in value is they have to sell their properties and move. And you hear a lot of people coming here because of the schools. I've also heard of a lot of people, our next door neighbors, put their house up for sale because of the taxes. So I think the community has some really tough choices. Um, we do have some financial constraints. We have to decide as a community where we want to put those monies. I hope people come out, vote, and we try to make the right decisions for our community. It, it, it's a tough choice. And I think you've heard and just kind of, you know, the rates have already gone up. We've already talked about what those numbers are. I think what you've heard from around the table is we're probably looking at the next couple of years. You're, you, there's not going to be any property tax relief. It's probably going to continue to go up. So at some point as a community, we really have to decide where do we want to put our resources, what can we afford, what are our, what's our budget, and live within that budget. So I, I hope people express themselves at the polls, and we'll, we'll see where that goes. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, my turn. So um, I'm not going to repeat anything that was said. I'll just say ditto. Please, please, please get out and vote. Um, I did have a couple of tidbits of information I wanted to share. It was 43 positions. Were the, were, I, I, I've been watching intently for that one. It was 43 positions, that either by attrition or, or um, whatever. Yeah. So it's 43. Of course, the lion's share is in um, for the, fire department. the fire department, and I do applaud Finance Committee for trying to make one small BB step towards doing something with it. Um, I did ask our lovely town manager to <laughs> begrudgingly give me. Um, when we talk about what we think the impact is, um, you know, th there's a kind of a formula that goes into how we arrive to, well, we think it'll be 5% and we'll think it'll be 4%. And why does this community think it's going to be two and we're at, you know, you know, there's several factors that come into how we come to that number. Um, so I did just ask, kind of real quick, um, just to change a little bit, if, if, if we had our natural growth projection right now is at 15 million, what, what does it look like when we go to 20 million? Um, and the number's a little nicer. <laughs> it's not a lot nicer, but it, but it is a little nicer, and we're down closer to five and a half. Um, so again, that, that's in that small, just if, if our valuation comes in at 20 million. Um, the thing I wanted to share the most, which um, I wrote down somewhere, oh, there we are, is what we're trending in our growth. It, 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 15 million is, um, which is great to be conservative, and, and certainly you always want to project and, and be, you know, really low rather than over over project. Um, our projection for that rate for the 5.69 is only at 15 million. 
Um, again, you know, we're five and at 5.5 if we come in at 20 million, but our average growth has been um, by far much better than that. Between new construction, new you know, new home building, um, our commercial, our natural growth value um, was 40 million for 2015, um, 30 million for 2014, and, and 50 million for 2013. So again, I do caution. I, I think, um, although it's good to know where where you are and where you think the impact is going to be and what the total, you know, it is a guess. And I would wager on that guess that we will do better than than what it says. Um, I, he, he, he's giving me the look, but I'm I'm going to wager that we're going to do better. Um, I, I think so. So we have some promising news. We have some wonderful new shops coming in right here and. Um, so I, I think we're going to do a little better than, than where we're thinking. Um, last but not least, um, yeah, no, I think everybody did it enough. So, anybody else? I think we've debated enough. <laughs> yeah, so we're blue in the face, I think. So, yep. all right. So, on the main <coughs> motion, is this a roll call vote? Thank you for reminding me. So, we will start on your end, John. Councilor Baybine? Yes. Councilor Donovan? Yes. Councilor Caterina? Yes. Councilor Hayes? No. Councilor Blaze? No. Councilor St. Clair? Yes. And Council Chair Holbrook? Yes. All right, so that is a vote. We're going to take a five minute recess because I'm sure there's probably some clear out, and we'll reconvene in five minutes.
Um, I think he's been All on the right. Time. Welcome Good. back to see you for our Good. remainder of our meeting. And we have our next mm -hmm. item of business is order number 15-037, which is act on the names posted to the various committee boards at the May 6, 2015 town council meeting as recommended by the appointments committee. And does anybody wish to speak on this item? And none. Move approval. Second. And any discussion? And seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. On to new business. Order number 15-038 is a first reading and schedule of public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments of Chapter 1002, Shellfish Conservation Ordinance. And does anybody wish to speak on this matter? And seeing <laughs> none, um, our room cleared out. Um, and actually, if you wouldn't mind, would you mind introducing this? Just I'll introduce, uh, I must admit, I've drifted away from the issue, but it first came to light uh, early in this, this year and uh, initially came to uh, Shellfish Commission um, back in February, and it's taken some time to, to work back through the system. <laughs> but essentially, uh, uh, the issue came to us um, in terms of an issue the Department of Labor had with respect to our mandatory conservation time. And so, uh, based on that, ruling a number of main communities with similar ordinances have been changing theirs, and uh, Scarborough is no different in that regard. Um, I'd like to defer to someone else on, uh, up here to, for a more substantive uh, explanation, but um, Jessica, are you able yeah. to speak to um, the substance? Sure. And um, I was sorry, I was trying to check to see if we had a motion. <laughs> Um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the nutshell of the changes to this all arose out of um, another community that found out they had a conflict with the right. Department of Labor yes. right. and, and with children and, and, and the right. ability to, you know, um, child labor laws and some of those things. So it went to Shellfish Committee, and the nutshell of the changes were that they were going to waive for um, anybody under the age of 18, any conservation hours. And then from from there, um, what they decided to do with the remainder of over 18 and what to do with your conservation hours uh, was that you may either um, perform those conservation hours or you would go back into the lottery. So it would not be an automatic renewal if you didn't perform those hours. Um, and, uh, I <coughs> What's that? Is that your committee? Yep, it is, yep. Was that unanimous out of that committee? Finally, yeah. I mean, they, they had some issues around. <laughs> I yeah. remember Fisherman. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We got there. We got there. It was a little, they got really, they got really interested in some of the language, but I mean, a lot of it had to do around high tide work and low tide. Oh work. yes. But oh they, yes. They eventually got the language the way they they wanted it. Yes, but that, but essentially that's it. And oops, oops, and um, so we do need a motion. Motion to approve. And so we have a first and a second, and is there any discussion? Nope. And seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. All right, on to the next one is order number 15-039, act on the recommendations to appoint Mr. Arthur J. Colvin as the representative from Scarborough to serve on the Long Creek Watershed Management District Board of Directors. And is there anybody that wishes to speak on this matter? And seeing that, <laughs> uh, and if you would, if you just yeah. introduce us to this, Tom. Yes, uh, parts of Scarborough are included in Long Creek Watershed and the, uh, the Watershed Management District. The composition of that district uh, board of directors uh, is very specific, and there is uh, to be a Scarborough landowner that sits on the, on the board. Our sliver of involvement, if you will, from a geography point of view, is very small. In fact, it's limited to the Eco Main property. And so uh, since inception and uh, with the resignation of the prior engineer, um, we're proposing uh, to appoint his replacement uh, to serve in that capacity on the, on the management district. All right, so can we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. And any discussion? And seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Eight is non-action items. We have none at this time. 
Item number nine, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. And we'll go ahead and start down there with you, Peter. Nothing significant to report, okay. I guess, in the interest of time. Sweet. Ed? Um, last week I attended the East and Trails Management Division uh, meeting down in Kennebunk. Uh, everything is copacetic. Uh, they are going to have, on the 28th of this month, next Thursday at Public Works, a uh, kind of a workshop for other towns that are involved with the Eastern Trail uh, down at Public Works. Um, and Mike and his people are going to be explaining how they go about maintaining the trails and how they hide all the money <laughs> that they don't get. Uh, I also attended the Eastern Trails Alliance annual meeting at the uh, Old Marsh Country Club last Thursday. Uh, found that to be very, very interesting. They had a series of, or they had three speakers talking about the developing the trail in the southern part of the state, uh, how they're mapping out, uh, there's a ton of different trails down there, how they're mapping out the trails, how they're putting um, National historic uh, sites on on maps, uh, uh, and then thinking about how they're going to link all the trails together. I, I found it very very interesting, um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. Okay, I'm good for tonight. Thank okay. you, De Marie. Um, the Legislative Policy Committee of Maine Municipal, basically, we just get emails occasionally on what we think about certain bills or permutations of bills that are coming through in Augusta. Uh, Conservation Commission is postponed till June, and that's it for me tonight. Uh, Energy Committee met this morning. Tom and I uh, were there with the Energy Committee for an hour and a half discussing uh, how to do the analysis of uh, the trash disposal uh, responsibility uh, that they've been given to report back to us within one year. Uh, 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 Deb McDonough did a terrific job of helping to uh, focus and organize and uh, get this off the ground. Uh, we have a pretty good sense of how we're going to approach it. Obviously, it's dispose less, save money. Uh, those are our two goals that we'll try and report back within a year to this uh, to this council. Thanks. John? Uh, Seg Code's meeting is tomorrow morning, and the only real item under finance is just the, the next step, and I'm not going to focus on budget or referendum, but uh, the next two big items that we'll be undertaking is um, it's that time of year, let alone time in the cycle, that we need to uh, uh, put out an RFP for legal services as well as counting CPA auditing. So uh, we'll be tackling that at the onset of when it's available, when it's appropriate. All right. And um, for me, there's not a, um, a ton to report. I, I did have um, two things. I had a round up historic preservation. We're kind of in limbo. We do have some appointments coming. Um, but I did have a meeting. Um, I went on behalf of the town with uh, Dan Bacon down to Greater Portland Landmarks and had a conversation with them um, and their board members. They were very interested to hear about what's going on with Scarborough and some of the efforts being made. And um, so I thought that was a very um, interesting meeting, certainly a beautiful building <coughs> that I had not been in before. Um, Portland, so metered parking. And, um, and I would just report that the Housing Alliance does have a meeting tomorrow evening at 6.30 p.m. And that's it for my liaison report. And on to item number 10, which is the town manager report. Two quick things. Uh, one, I've been terribly remiss, well, not terribly, but for two weeks I have not sent out my weekly report. I've been preoccupied with budget. I Mental fully safety. expect this week uh, I'll get back on track and stay on track going forward. So there might be a whole backlog of things. Um, hopefully you find what I send somewhat helpful. Uh, and also the, the real big thing I want to put on your agenda is the so-called Summit 2 meeting. Uh, Karen Martin from SEDCO is coordinating the second um, meeting of all town boards and committees. And for those of you that may have attended the first one, it was it was quite an opportunity for folks, one, to get to know each other sometimes for the first time, but also just the conversation about what the respective committees are doing and, and a recognition that there's a lot of commonality. And so 
That meeting will be next Thursday, May 28th at the Wentworth um, cafeteria at 6.15. Uh, you should have all received an invite. Uh, if you can come out, it's worth your time. I think you'll be very impressed with the, the quality of the committee of, uh, appointees. So, hope to see you there. I'm ready. And on to the next item, council member comments. We'll start on the other end with Sean. Uh, thank you. Just as a uh, kind of a closing statement um, regarding the budget, um, one of the areas or one of the focuses that I consistently heard was and one of the questions that I, I could not answer at that particular time and haven't answered but wanted to publicly was um, a, a citizen asked, and maybe a couple, two, three, <laughs> or several, you know, what happens when a citizen and a family can no longer pay their taxes on their residence, and what, what do we have um, in town to, um, to deal with that? And so, you know, as we're looking at the struggles that we're faced with with our budget, not only in the short term, but really looking at the long term, one of the newest concepts that's coming forward, and it's something that I actually brought forward um, when I campaigned, I really hope that we begin to station the uh, community to a point where we can start talking about programs that support um, this, um, and it's called aging in place. You know, how can our citizens age in place in their uh, current home, um, and what services are needed to, to be able to do that, as well as what policies do we need to have to support that, um, both financial as well as health care and safety and, you know, everything that goes along with that, um, activities and really look at the comprehensive needs of uh, keeping everyone in town in town. So um, I really hope that this is kind of the preface to that, given the struggles that we're dealing with with the budget and recognizing that there are people out there that uh, will eventually need some assistance at some point. I uh, pick up on that point. Uh, uh, we had reduced the budget for the uh, senior assistance program because the state changed the rules on it and we're seeing underutilization of it. So uh, with the chair's blessing, I would hope to uh, have the rules committee meet and reconsider where we are with our, our standards for the application of that program. So that, that was one thing I wanted to speak about. I did want to thank the uh, school board for their cooperation in the budget process. It's arduous. Uh, week after week for the last several months doing this. And the school board, uh, not only did they meet with themselves, but they also were always constantly meeting with us, particularly Chris Caeza, who worked very closely with our uh, finance committee chair. And, and having seen it now for two years, uh, they really did a terrific job. On a lighter note, the uh, seniors end their high school lives in the next, <laughs> the next few days. The prom was held last week, and I happened to play in the Nonsuch Men's League, and so I was out there today, and I played with Drew Kane and his dad, uh, and Drew was the number one player on the state champion uh, Scarborough High School uh, uh, golf team, a terrific golfer, and happens to be best friends with the young man who took my granddaughter to the senior prom. <laughs> so that was kind of a nice connection for me. So thank you. I can segue into both of these. <laughs> um, the Legislative Policy Committee at Maine Municipal uh, is tracking, well, obviously, legislation um, related to um, tax issues. Uh, and I'm hoping that they restore, work to restore some some of the uh, rebates and, and programs, homestead exemption programs that were in effect. Um, so we need to stay tuned on that. They're supposed to uh, get done by June 17th, but the word is that isn't going to happen. So, But they need to be done by July 1st, hopefully, or they'll be shutting down the state government, which wouldn't be good. And then my other segue is off from Bill, speaking of high school graduation, bear with me. The Scarborough Educational Foundation, through Jody Shea, who's on the school board, asked me to mention that they have something called Operation Graduation Balloons, and you pay $5 to the Scarborough Educational Foundation, which they keep, 
towards their expenses, and they give each, every single one of the graduating seniors in Scarborough will get at least one, if not more, balloons tied onto their mailboxes at their own. Um, I don't know if it's done graduation day, a baccalaureate, or whatever. It's kind of cool when you drive around town and you see those balloons. Um, tomorrow's the last day to buy them. As I said, it's five dollars per balloon, and you can. Con I'm going to say contact Jody Shea on the school board for further information. And that's it. All right. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say actually thank you to Councillor Donovan. Um, there was a couple things that he said during the debate of going back and forth with the budget that actually made a lot of sense and um, helped me sort of process through some of those things that I was internally fighting with. Um, you know, like we've all said, it's not an easy process and it's something that we all um, don't enjoy. We always know we're going to upset somebody. Um, and one thing I wanted to say is that it's not just our um, elderly population, although that, that is a, a, a large group for us in Scarborough, um, a group that I think a lot of people forget about and don't realize how up and coming our elderly population in Scarborough is. But there are there is a younger generation that is also struggling with paying their taxes. Um, you know, I personally I wasn't going to get into this, but you know, 14 years ago I moved here for the schools. I was newly pregnant with my daughter, and my husband and I at the time moved here. Um, and I 14 years ago would never ever have thought I would be in the position that I'm in today um, and dealing with the things that um, my children and I are dealing with. And the home that we bought at that time was something that we could afford at that time. And we're in a very different position now. So, um, you know, I think as criticized as the council can get during budget time, I think people forget that we are human too. We have families and we're all, we are trying to do the best that we can, every single one of us. So, thank you. Um, I'd just like to mention the, the fact that the Long Range Planning uh, Committee has asked Dan Bacon to begin the process of uh, looking at the um, zoning regulations of the three different beach communities, and, and they're starting at uh, Higgins Beach, uh, and on June 5th, 6th, and 7th, uh, uh, some people from uh, some sort of an agency that designs special communities is coming into the community and they'll be there all weekend long holding little sessions with uh, people. Uh, they'll be walking around the community. They'll actually be staying there overnight. They're renting a house. Um, so it should be very, very interesting. It's, it's going to be a good first step in creating a, uh, a zoning package for a small community, uh, and, and it's really been needed over the years. I mean, people mm -hmm. have struggled for years, and the zoning board has struggled for years having to deal with those, so hopefully it's going to be a big success, and uh, after Higgins Beach, uh, I'm sure they're going to go to Pine Point and uh, probably Prospect. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess I'll just kind of conclude and kind of circle back to the budget conversation and just say I too have received a ton of emails. I didn't count them, but I just hope and really encourage folks that it's a real good choice for the community. I hope, you know, with all the emails I've gotten and all the energy in those emails, I hope you get your friends and everybody to come to the polls and, and tell us as, as a council what you want to do this year with the budgets. I think it's really important. So just you know, we'd love to have the budget passed by the majority of the town. So please come, come out to vote, and, you know, we'll, we'll take it from there. Thank you. All right. And um, I do just want to make a little friendly note. Um, reminder that Memorial Day is coming. Yeah, it will be um, coming up this Monday is our annual Memorial Day parade. So that starts at 10 o'clock up here in Oak Hill. It's always always nice. They always have the marching band and, and you know, the kids come down playing their instruments and, and, and it's a nice time. <coughs> and they're predicting fabulous weather for, yeah, for our Monday parade. Um, and I believe that's like at 10 o'clock if I read that email correctly. Um, so here we are at the end of another budget. Budget? Yeah, budget. I don't know. My brain just stops <laughs> after budget. Um, I, I will say... Uh, 
two, two things. I, I do appreciate, and although I poked fun about the counting counting emails, I poked fun at it. Um, I do appreciate the emails. I do actually read every single one of them. Um, I do apologize that in the last two days I've had a flood, I think, of like 40. Um, I couldn't possibly even cut and paste respond enough at that point. So, um, But I do get them. I do read them. Um, I do appreciate, um, I, like Kate mentioned earlier, you know, you hear both sides of, of an equation. You hear the folks that uh, certainly advocate for, for great points at um, maintaining funding in the schools, if not increasing, and then certainly the folks that are um, experiencing some hardship and, and, and feeling like they need a break. Um, I have always said, you know, it's kind of one of those double-edged swords. If you've made everybody unhappy, you probably did your job as a counselor. Um, the other thing I would like to express is, um, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent. I, I, I've always said, I think I've said this every year now, I certainly have my counselor opinion and, and what I think is in the best interest of the community as a counselor. And I have a personal opinion. And no, those do not always almost never coincide. Um, so, you know, I, I, I know that I will surely exercise my, my civil right to vote, and I enjoy that right and that privilege, and, and I would like to encourage everybody in the community to do so as well. Um, and with that, we are now on item number 12, which is adjournment. To approval. Second. All those in favor? 